Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Galatians chapter 5. And my text is going to be from verse 11 down to verse 18. I've entitled this, Standing Firm in the Truth. That's what we have here, this setting of Paul's confrontation with all of all people. Peter, regarding God's acceptance of the Gentiles on equal footing with the Jews, that in Christ there is no difference. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. So for me, this is a pivotal portion of scripture for us to understand because there is no room for compromise when it comes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is no respecter of persons. When he chose those that he would save, he chose them of his own good will and purpose, not for anything that he saw in any sinner, not because of their color or race or cultural standing, but sinners. That's who he chose. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's the message of the gospel. When the scripture speaks that God so loved or in this manner loved the world, he was actually speaking of the Gentile world, which to the Jews was an offense. Such was the division between Jews and Gentiles that for any to declare that Christ was, first of all, the Messiah, the one of whom the Old Testament spoke, and that secondly, he didn't come to set up a Jewish kingdom, but he came to save sinners that God the Father had given him from every tribe, nation, and tongue, and culture, and language. That's an amazing thing when you consider God's grace towards sinners. And so as we study about how God purposed, first of all, that Paul, being a Jew, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he said, and yet it wasn't to the Jews that God sent him, but it was to the Gentiles. He was to be a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the Jews, but here we find Peter caught in compromise. And that's why this is an important subject for us to consider. There's no room for compromise when it comes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here in verses 11 through 13, Galatians 5, we see the reason for Paul's public rebuke of the apostle Peter. Everybody has such a high regard for Peter, they can't imagine anybody ever rebuking him. And yet here, Paul was brought to a situation where he could not remain quiet. And I'm sure that some of us have faced those situations. It's a matter of asking the Lord for wisdom as to when to speak and when to be quiet because we see so much compromise around us. But here, the Lord purposed that Paul speak and address Peter for his hypocrisy, and we have much to learn from this. Let's read this, Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 11. He says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, which is the one thing that those that were Jewish professing believers were wanting to require that everything else Christ had already fulfilled in the law, but there still was circumcision that they held to because that was what identified them as Jews. And he said, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would, they were even cut off, which trouble you. And that's an interesting term that he uses, cut off, because that's what happens in circumcision, the cutting off of the foreskin. And so Paul uses that term and says, I would, they were cut off. Those that preach circumcision as some kind of standard for salvation. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is summed up 
in one word. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed by one another. And this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that I, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You're probably wondering why I'm reading out of Galatians chapter 5. Well, that's because that's what I wrote down here. But the text is actually Galatians chapter 2. So let's go back there. We can start over. Okay. All of this is good. But let's go to Galatians chapter 2. This will make more sense with regard to standing in the truth. Galatians chapter 2. I knew as I was reading, I thought, this is not the portion where Paul dealt with Peter. It's back here in Galatians chapter 2. Now, beginning with verse 11, Galatians 2, 11 through 18, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. That's quite a strong statement there. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, that is, of the Jews. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So here we have the reason then why Paul rebukes the apostle Peter publicly. It says when Peter had come to Antioch, Antioch was the first place up in Syria where they were called Christians, Christians is the way I like to pronounce that, those that were named with Christ. And it was outside of Israel and so here we find Peter having come there. And while he was there in Antioch, again, not in Israel, among the Jews of Jerusalem, he was welcomed even by these who would have been Gentiles. Now, Peter had already approved Paul's gospel and ministry when Paul came to Jerusalem. We saw that last time in Galatians 2 and verse 9. It says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So it wasn't that Peter even questioned here that the gospel should be preached to the Gentiles. It was clear that that's how God had raised up Paul, that he might so do. And God used Peter himself even to welcome Gentiles into the faith without any precondition. So Peter had already had this encounter. If you remember, go back to Acts chapter 11, and verses 1 through 18, this is where the Lord gave Peter a vision that he should go into the house of Cornelius, who was a centurion, a Roman centurion. And you can see how it begins here in Acts 11, giving you some context that's important here. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So those in Judea, down in the region around Jerusalem, had heard that the Gentiles had also received the word. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. It's a different 
contesting than we have over here with Paul confronting him. Here it says, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. And Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend as it had been a sheet, a great sheet, yet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. The voice answered me again from heaven, but God hath, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times. And all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately, there were three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting, moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Peter, as a Jew, this may well have been the first time he ever had gone into a Gentile house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy household shall be saved, delivered from darkness. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them, this was the conclusion. I'm reading all this to show you that Peter knew better. Because this had clearly been revealed. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Repentance means eyes to look to Christ alone as their only salvation. So it wasn't that Peter was ignorant when here he's found among these Gentiles in Galatians chapter 2, eating with them and not thinking anything of it until such time as some of the Jews showed up. And here we see a little bit of peer pressure, if you will. It says there he withdrew and separated himself Note the word, fearing those who were of the circumcision. I'll tell you, fear is a snare. And when it comes to standing for the truth of the gospel, fear has no place as a rival with the truth of the gospel. Even though Peter had been previously in agreement and welcoming these Gentiles into the congregation, even there in Antioch, without bringing them under the law of Moses. See, that's the thing that people wonder about. Well, is there some part of that law to which we are still obligated? And the answer is no. Because if you say that there is, then that means that Christ didn't finish the work. We're under the law to Christ. In other words, he is the one who came and fulfilled the law on our behalf. And we live in that freedom and liberty that he has wrought and bought for those for whom he died. But when Peter came to Antioch, and Antioch, remember, would have been Paul's home congregation because Barnabas went over to Tarsus and brought him to Antioch. And in Acts 13, that's where he ministered along with Barnabas for some time before they set them apart to go out and preach into the uttermost parts of the earth. So Paul had no problem, even though he was a Jew, with 
associating with these Gentiles that the Lord had brought into the church. But here Peter was another story. He would associate with these so long as some of his Jewish brethren didn't come and put any pressure on him. Now these men that came, it says in verse 12, that certain came from James. James would have been the preacher, the pastor, head elder, if you will, down in Jerusalem, and that was primarily Jewish. And so when they came, before that certain came, he did eat with the Gentiles, didn't think anything of it. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Knowing their background, Peter knew they would be offended. Because remember, Peter spent most of his time there in Jerusalem. He was an apostle to the Jews. And he knew they would be offended with this fellowship that he was having with these Gentiles who had not come under the law. That's the thing about the Gentiles. They'd never been raised under the law. The law was primarily given to the Jewish nation. And so when Christ came, those for whom he died, he did not obligate them to become Jews, not even down to circumcision. They had always been outside of the law. And yet Christ fulfilled the law for them as much as he fulfilled it for the Jews. But these that would have come from Jerusalem in their prejudice, in the back of their mind, they likely didn't even consider these uncircumcised Gentiles even to be Christians. Remember, that's what the great debate was there in Acts 15. Can they be saved if they're not circumcised? It's like people ask today, can a person be saved without being baptized? Baptism is... A big deal for many or can a person be saved without walking an aisle saying a prayer and uh, signing on the dotted line I once heard it said that you couldn't be saved if you didn't openly verbally audibly confess the Lord Jesus Christ you couldn't even do it in your heart it had to be through your mouth see these are all conditions that people put for salvation but salvation is of the Lord and so this is the truth for which Paul now would need to stand true. Paul or Peter had known that God didn't require Gentiles to come under the law of Moses for salvation. He'd seen that in that vision he'd had that we just read about in Acts 11. But what this was, and this is why Paul was to confront him to his face, Peter had turned back on all that he had known about the place of the Gentiles in the church of Christ. And now he, by his very actions, was treating these uncircumcised Gentiles as if they were not saved at all. Does that mean that Peter himself then fell from grace? No, you can't. And this is why the Lord directed Paul to say what he did to Peter, to confront him to his face. Because it seems here that Peter took this action shamefacedly. It's amazing. And you can imagine perhaps the surprise even on the Gentiles when Peter all of a sudden gets up. Here the words describe forcibly how Peter stood up, and when it says separated himself, I don't know how he did that, maybe acting like he had something else to do at that particular time, but he could not hide. And that's why we read here Paul saying that he withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed there in verse 11. I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. This shows just how serious a matter this was, not only for Paul, but I believe for any of us that are children of God and taught by the Spirit of God. We're not to compromise. We're to stand 
for the truth as it is in Christ, and that is that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're not to make racial divides as to who we associate with and who we don't. If a person is the Lord's and taught of Christ, then we welcome them as a brother. And it was such a matter here that it was an actual public confrontation. You see that in verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, and he's speaking even of Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who had sought Paul and brought him over, introduced him to this congregation in Antioch. And yet even Barnabas, it says there in verse 13, was carried away with their dissimulation. But Paul made it a public matter. He didn't just try to deal with this in the corner. I said to Peter, he says, before them all. Sometimes you have to do that. And I'm not sure exactly how that took place. I don't believe that Peter stood up yelling and, or Paul stood up yelling and screaming, Peter, what are you doing? But this was a serious enough matter because it involved the eating together. It says before the certain men came from James, Peter would eat with the Gentiles. Eating in that culture meant oneness. You didn't eat with enemies. And yet when they came, Peter withdrew and separated himself. This separation was probably at some meal that the congregation was having together like we do once a month we gather and we celebrate the lord's table and then we enjoy a meal together different ones bringing in their food back in the first century they called this actually the love feast the agape feast but here, Peter was manifesting anything but love. You can do a lot of things on the outward and pretend to be at one with others, but unless it's in the heart, it's not really a love feast. But at this time, the early church would remember the Lord's death, and then they would partake of the Lord's table together, and that's where a lot of different evils came in as Paul describes there in 1 Corinthians 11 some were eating before others others were getting there late because they had to tidy up back at the house and when they got there all the food was gone and then he says even worse many were drunken yes there was wine served at these meals as part of the meal and yet they used the occasion for the flesh so this would have been the occasion now where Paul, seeing the hypocrisy, seeing Peter withdrawing himself all before these others showed up, and it says very much there the reason, fearing those who were of the circumcision. That explains why Peter did this. It's not that he doubted the truth as it is in Christ, that indeed Christ had redeemed a people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. That's clear. That had been made clear to him already. But out of fear. That's why the scriptures say the fear of man is a snare. Think about yourself and some of your associations of family members and others, acquaintances, that don't believe this gospel. And that want you to compromise to accept them because they want to be seen just as much saved, is what they call it, as you are. But out of fear of offending, you don't say anything, even though you know they are clearly not standing in the truth as it is in Christ. But here was a different situation. Here were these gathered that God had called out by his Spirit of the Gentiles, and yet out of fear, even though for a while Peter ate with them, sat down and ate with them, yet at a given moment now he stood up and withdrew himself out of fear. We know the example even of Peter 
when first of all the Lord was telling him that he would go to the cross and die and Peter boldly said that he would never deny the Lord even if it meant going to prison or going to death and the Lord said Peter the cock's not even going to crow in the morning before you deny me three times and what happened when they took Christ into the judgment hall there was a little girl there just a little girl that was outside that recognized him around the fire as being one of the disciples and as soon as she called Peter out again out of fear it says there that he denied the Lord with cursings <laughs> he was swearing saying that he didn't know the Lord that's what fear does does it mean that he was any less the Lord's no but his sin was just as grievous as that of Judas that betrayed the Lord. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, Christ told Peter, I have prayed for thee, and when thou art converted, go and encourage the brethren. Judas didn't have a representative. Christ was not his representative. He was a son of perdition. And so I want to make that clear here that even though Peter was to be blamed, as Paul says, Yet he was nonetheless the Lord's. The Lord had already paid his sin debt. And it would be necessary that he would learn from this experience. You see, it would be easy for us to criticize Peter. But every one of us knows that in our hearts, though we know and believe the gospel, Given the right timing and opportunity, out of fear, we might likely deny the Lord ourselves. And yet I'm thankful that the Lord never abandons us. And I'm thankful that even here he brought the Apostle Paul to confront him to his face. I believe this would have been a loving confrontation. That the Lord would not leave Peter where he was but that would use the word of Paul to turn his fear into faith, if you will, of acknowledging as being wrong and that he would, from this point forward, I don't recall anywhere after this where we read of Peter ever compromising this again that as the Lord directed him, yes, primarily to the Jews, but there would never be a time where he would withdraw himself. Such is the life lesson that the Lord had taught him. And I'm sure all of us have those times when we can look back to that those life lessons have made us stronger in the faith and uncompromising, unwavering. We don't know what it was about these certain men from James. There's a reason that it's mentioned there in verse 12, before that certain came from James. Every word of scripture is important and it's there for a purpose. What was it about these certain men that made Peter afraid? Perhaps they were men of strong personality. And as strong as what Peter thought he was, yet he wasn't as strong as he thought he was. Perhaps they were men of great prestige and influence in the church there in Jerusalem. And perhaps they even made threats of one kind or another. Whatever it was, it pushed Peter back to legalism. And I will tell you, there's no greater danger for any of us than to have people of influence that when they begin to pressure us, they force us back into a legalistic spirit or legalistic thinking. You say, what's legalism? Well, it's assuming that there's some part of that law that we still must fulfill in order to have acceptance before God? And the answer is no. That's why Paul later in Galatians chapter 5 said very strongly, stand fast therefore in the liberty 
wherewith Christ hath made us free. You know, the number one thing that legalists hate is liberty. <laughs> That's the way the Pharisees were. They didn't like our Lord Jesus Christ telling the sinner, your sins be forgiven you, because they had all of these conditions by which they would impose on these who were weak and make them think that apart from following those rules and regulations that they couldn't have acceptance with God. That's a terrible state to be in. That's why Paul says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. If Christ has paid your sin debt, it is paid. There's nothing more that you need to do in order to have that acceptance before God. We're accepted in the beloved at the cross. Not only were, was sin put away, but God justified. So complete was the work of Christ that there remained nothing but righteousness to impute to the account of those for whom Christ died. Sanctification. That's when God set apart his people. It was there at the cross. It was complete. But even someone like Barnabas, it's, Paul sees fit here to mention Barnabas, that was carried away with their hypocrisy. And again, he was under the influence of these others that came up from Jerusalem. You know, Barnabas, when you stop and think about it, he, he stood beside Paul when he first met the apostles back there in Acts 9 and verse 27. And it was Barnabas that went and sought Paul and brought him to Antioch to help in the ministry there. That was in Acts 11, verse 25. And yet this defection of Barnabas shows the weakness of the flesh. And that's why we need the Lord to keep us. Even when we say we know the Lord or we say, well, I'll never do that. Don't ever say I'll never do that. Because if the Lord ever hangs you out to dry, that's why Christ said in his prayer, to his disciples, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That should be our constant prayer, knowing our flesh, knowing how weak we are. But even here, Barnabas, this would have been a far more serious nature with regard to the Gentile freedom than even Peter, perhaps. Because you say, well, Peter was sent to the Jews, but Barnabas wasn't. Barnabas was the foremost champion of, <clears throat> of the Gentiles and the liberty that there is in Christ and Christ calling them. And yet here we see him dissimulating is what that says. It says the rest of the Jews who played the hypocrite with him, they were carried away with their dissimulation there in verse 13. This shows that the matter was bigger than just Peter and Barnabas. Peter first made the compromise by acting as if the Gentile believers were not believers at all, because that's really what you're saying. If you can't eat with them, then it must be they're not the Lord's. But on what basis? On their race? I know there's some that are very racially divided when it comes to this matter of the gospel, and they won't sit down in the same building with a, a person of another race. That's nothing but sinful hardness as to the work of God in Christ. But here, first, it seems Peter made the compromise of acting as if these were not believers, and Barnabas followed. So you can't just blame Peter. And then the rest of the Jews, it says, were carried away in the dissimulation see that in verse 13 and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him so it wasn't just that Peter was there amongst these Gentiles and they were all Gentiles and it was just Peter and Barnabas. there were other Jews already meeting together for worship that all of a sudden you can imagine standing up and separating themselves and the shock of those that were Gentile believers when it says to dissimulate there in verse 13, it literally means to play the hypocrite or to be carried away with their hypocrisy. 
It's interesting that the word hypocrisy means one who puts on a mask. In other words, an actor. Back then, if a certain actor had to play several parts, he'd go off stage and then he'd come on with a different mask. So he was playing different parts. That's what the word hypocrisy means. So in this case, Peter, Barnabas, and the rest of the Jews in this congregation all were acting. I will tell you there's nothing worse than acting before God or men. You know, people come in and they play at worship. They act as if they're one thing. And yet, like Christ said, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So that's why this is such a serious matter to deal with. And that's why Paul, in verse 14, confronted Peter publicly. It says, when I saw, verse 14, that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. That's really what we're looking at here. Standing firm in the truth of the gospel. I said unto Peter, before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Gentiles, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? That's a good question. When Paul saw this at the very foundation, this wasn't just an issue of seating arrangements at a church dinner or table manners or being a good host. No. No. At the very foundation, it had to do with the truth of the gospel. You say, well, how can something like that be so vital as it affects the truth of the gospel? Well, it's because the truth of the gospel declares that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free. We're going to see that more when we get over into Galatians chapter 3. That's the conclusion there in verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. What? For ye are all one in Christ. God looks upon every one for whom Christ paid the debt as being one. So don't you dare come with your prejudice or divide or looking down your nose at this group or that group, thinking somehow they are lesser citizens of the kingdom than you are. That's just that pride and hypocrisy. But we all battle it. We all have to fight it. We're proud of our heritage, but that heritage is nothing if it's not in Christ. And that's where the foundation is. And that's why it was necessary here for Paul to confront Peter in such a strong manner. It wasn't just that Paul had a domineering personality. In fact, he himself said that, that in presence he, he was very poorly. People that looked on him in his physical pres presence, he, did, he was not very strong when it came to that. But, but in the gospel, in the word, he didn't hesitate to declare the truth. And even Paul had to learn that when he went to Jerusalem, you can read that in the book of Acts, and he sought to compromise to try to satisfy some of the Jews. He actually went and did a, a Nazarite vow, shaved his head, and would have gone into the temple to offer a sacrifice to end that after he'd been seven days doing it. You say, how could Paul do that? Well, that was his moment of compromise, and the Lord stopped him. There was a throng that rose up when he went in because they said he'd taken a Gentile into the temple. So the Lord stopped him mercifully. And I believe Paul would have learned from that example as well. But here Paul, the Lord purposed that he expose Peter's hypocrisy in what? Appearing to live under the law. You can't be under the law and then at the same time under grace. That's what the gospel of liberty tells us. Either the law has been fulfilled or it hasn't. And if you say it hasn't, and if there's one part of that law still to be fulfilled in order to find satisfaction with God, then Christ accomplished nothing. 
You see that over in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. At the end of this chapter, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, any obedience to the law, requirement of the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What you're saying is the work of Christ accomplished nothing at all. And that's what I say to people that say, yeah, Christ died, but it still requires your decision in order to make it effectual. Well, if that's the case, then that means that the death of Christ has nothing to do with salvation if it requires you to complete it. And so in verses 15 and 16, this is the heart of the truth of the gospel. And I'm going to come back to this because this is what's vital. It says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified, notice, by the faith of Christ. It's not saying by believing in Christ, but by the faithfulness of Christ, what he worked out. And not by the works of the law, nor by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So who are the Jews by nature, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law? Peter, he grew up an observant Jew until Christ called him. And yet Paul declares there that that's not why we're considered right before God. I grew up very in a very strict religious home with lots of rules and regulations, do's and don'ts and all these things, but that's not what justifies me before God by any works of the law that I ever did. It's only by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure your Bible says that. If you have a version that says faith in Jesus Christ, then get, a, get, get the authorized version because it's written here correctly. We're not justified by the works of the law. And that word justified literally means to be declared righteous. It's a legal concept whereby the person who is justified is the one who gets the verdict in a court of law. Well, whose court is it? It's God's court, not man's. Men can find a lot of fault with us, but our justification before God is in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Even we, it says, have believed in Jesus Christ. We believe in him as he's revealed in the scriptures. And yet not even our believing is what justifies us before God. We believe because we have been justified. And it's the faith of Jesus Christ, of it's of him, it's by him, it's through him that those that he has redeemed, he has justified, that we might be justified by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the clear emphasis there. We're not justified by being under the law of Moses. If you find people wanting to put you back under the law, run for your life. But it's the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, we do refuse fellowship with people that don't believe this message, don't believe this gospel, don't sit down with them and act like you're all one. You're not. But that wasn't the case here. Here were ones that had been taught of the Lord and believed that their justification was in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And therefore, they sat down to eat together and enjoy that fellowship. But oh, how a little bit of leaven can influence the whole lump. How a little bit of hypocrisy can mess things up when you see certain ones becoming arrogant and thinking, well, I can't eat with these because they're not of my kin or they're not of my, my race somehow. It says clearly by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And uh, that's just the truth as it is in Christ. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. What makes the difference? It's the faith of Christ. Not faith in Christ, but that faithfulness of Christ as the substitute 
whereby when he had finished the work, there remained nothing but righteousness for God to impute. We'll draw a line there and come back next time, Lord willing, pick up with this. Where Paul says in verse 17, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. In other words, compromising the truth. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. But we'll take a look at that next time. Stand firm, stand fast in the liberty whereby Christ has made you free. Amen.